interesting stuff. So has, has anyone ever been involved in a, in a lifting accident or a near miss? You must have been, Swaroop. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad, uh, can I just make a comment? Uh, Brad, can I make a comment uh, before everyone starts? See, guys, we are delivering this as a discussion, not as a, a webinar. So you're most welcome to stop Brad and ask your questions and share your experiences. And uh, when you're participating, always, you know, please try to keep your video open and mute your mic. So when you want to say something, just you can unmute by yourself and then share your thoughts. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Swara, please go ahead. Anybody? Yeah. Mahid? Yes, Mr. Ray. Yeah, we, of course. Uh, there has there has been yeah one or two near misses which I could uh, recollect from uh, yeah. my experience in my previous company, where uh, <laughs> the damage was uh, where the equipment like the lifting the spreader beam, it got uh, damaged. The connecting bolts which got ruptured and the load, it was a concrete block below. So it just fell off a 500, me, a 500 mm above, just like it was lifted a little bit high, half a meter high. And okay. as soon as the spreader beam uh, split at the connecting point, the concrete block uh, fell down. Like, oh. uh, unfortunately, it wasn't high enough to cause any uh, serious damage. The only damage caused was to the trailer on which the concrete block was mounted. Yeah, and uh, we had the root cause analysis of uh, use of the subcontractors using a substandard bolts for connecting the spreader beam, which was not updated to us. And uh, we thus got it corrected. We started uh, uh, taking the material test certificates for the uh, nuts and bolts for whichever they're using for the spreader beam. and. Uh, talk testing for connecting the spreader beam. And then thus we solved that issue and uh, we could uh, finish off with installing all the other concrete uh, girders using the same spreader beam and the same uh, uh, crawl creed. Okay, so did so you say the bolt the bolt failed on, on, the, on the shackle? Yes, the bolt bolts uh, failed on, on the spreader. When they, when they did the... Um... Accident investigation was it the client or was it an HBK internal one? No, uh, it was it was uh, an internal uh, investigation, which uh, which was headed by me and uh, by the HSE manager in our company. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot to get to. You got to keep asking why's and that. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So you got to basically somebody didn't have a. A procedure in place or somebody wasn't told to check the bolt and somebody didn't whatever so yes actually actually they they were a well-reputed uh, subcontractor who has finished the north corridor like uh, the noh2 project which they mm -hmm. have completed out there and it was a sort of a new activity for me so uh, and the consultant in substance so since uh, they didn't push for all the uh, all these details, and since the project was in uh, a fast track project, they wanted to start it off uh, with uh, no such uh, um, detailed inspection in the beginning. So, but later, after after this near mess, I had to like dig into the details, and I had to collect all the minor uh, documentation, and even that uh, starting from the material test certificate of the nuts and bolts, like. And there were two different suppliers which they had. One is Chinese and one the local supplier in Qatar. So I completely got rid of the Chinese uh, nuts and bowls and uh, started using from Qatar itself. Okay. Knowing HBK, you probably don't have time to think. You probably didn't even have enough time to put the investigation and root cause together. But no, that's a good one. I've had problems with Chinese bolts. I, I won't use them and, and in, up in um, QP and that. they. They don't like them. They, they have a. They don't test as rigorous as Crosby. Anyway, um, we got uh, uh, been... two more people. Uh, uh, Srinath, do you uh, do you want to go ahead? Yes. Ah, go ahead, Srinath. Hi. Nice to hear Good you. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, the same here. <laughs> Thanks, Malam. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Srinath. I'm right in front of a hospital now, so my, I won't, it's not better to switch on the video now. So can I uh, go on with audio? Yeah, go ahead, Srinath. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brad, uh, Mr. Adams, uh, good evening. Um, I'm, I'm mm. Srinath. I'm, I'm currently joining from Bahrain. Oh, so uh, I would like to share. Hi. Hi. So I would like to share one of my experience being part of our investigation team, wherein a crawler crane was. Um, lattice boom of a crawler crane was collapsed because of uh, boom hoist drop um, broken, actually. The, and we did investigation and root cause analysis and all. And in the end, we could uh, understand that there are two main reasons. One was uh, inappropriate uh, grade of the wire rope being used for the boom hoist, plus uh, lack of proper maintenance on the rope, lubrication on the rope. So when you mentioned inappropriate grade of rope, I mean, was that down to a procurement or was that your procurement? Yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was an uh, actually incompetent procurement method. No one in the company were aware of it. It was, it was actually a um, uh, piling and drilling contractor. They had 32 such crawler cranes, all Sumitomo Hitachi, and uh, all their ropes were, boom hoist ropes were uh, replaced with the same grade of the rope. It was uh, uh, initially, it was supposed to be a six by thirty-six, uh, you know, six by twenty-five, I believe, six by twenty-five IWRC uh, uh, rope of uh, Warrington Seal construction, uh, which is very good for the uh, abrasive resistance uh, and the nature of the job which the crane has to undergo. But uh, they replaced with a non-rotational rope of uh, uh, some uh, seven, nineteen by seven, I believe, and that uh, MBL there was a difference of. MBL, which was supposed to be for the uh, 6 by 25 version, was uh, 186 kilonewton, and the one which they replaced was 165, I believe. It was uh, three, four years back. It was uh, it was in a, a port actually. There was a port uh, uh, under construction in Oman, and uh, uh, it's it was working there for a couple of months actually. So due to that saline environment, the rope was already. Uh, uh, corroded very badly, and there wasn't any uh, any evidence of maintenance carried out on the rope. Not um, not a trace of grease was available or a lubricant was available on the rope. Plus, we could suspect even dynamic loading on the rope and uh, stretch was available. I mean, we could see there is a stretch in the rope because the uh, the variation in the diameter measured more than 11 percentage. So all this together. Okay led to the accident of uh, you know breaking of the boom hoist drop and the boom was collapsed 45 meter boom box collapsed onto the ground nobody was uh, uh, there was no casualty only the boom was damaged and further they did again mistake uh, uh, they uh, welded and uh, uh, repaired the boom by themselves there was many uh, you know mistake and because of my investigation report they had to ground all their 32 other crawler cranes because they did the same, they used the same wire up on all their crawler cranes. But I, I bet they saved a lot of money on that procurement by getting the cheaper, non rotating, smaller. Yeah. Was it a smaller diameter? Was it micron, micron same, thinner same. No, as well? No, 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 same. All were, both were 16 mm wire up. Only thing is that because of the grade and the difference in the grade, uh, the MBL was different by. Uh, Almost two ton, 2.2 ton. M MBL was, uh, you know, the, uh, different, but less than the actual uh, required version as per manufacturer recommendation. Well, oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, it's nice when you can get to the bottom of an accident and uh, make some force some change that's for the good. Um, for me, um, I spent most of my career in, in, in the UK and I've never seen any. Um, major lifting injuries where people got killed. Um, I, I saw a crane overturned once, but it wasn't until I took to the Middle East about 12 years ago and I was on a, I was a project manager for two projects and my contractor had an accident. And I'll just take you through that. They were lifting, if anybody's familiar with tunnel form, and here we have a, a 50 ton crane. Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. It was a 50 ton crane and the operator uh, decided that he, um, could make the reach to pull the slide the, the, the metal box out of the structure and he decided to bypass the limits and the 
rigor decided to uh, be standing on top of the, the tunnel form immediately in front uh, to, to guide the crane and direct it. And when the crane fell over, he happened to be under it. Now, that was my first death in my entire long career on a construction project. So it really shook me. And, and I can remember it to this day, March 20, 2009. Uh, what I do take away from this is that when you have an accident in Qatar, they take everybody involved with the lift. They take the operator, the supervisor, the project manager, and they take them all away, take their passports and hold them until they can assign blame. I know people have been away for two or three days and had their passports held for six months. So it's, it, it's very, it's very clear that when you write a lift plan, you need to go through and make sure people are signing for their responsibilities. Um, and, and if, if any of you want to get in touch with me, I, I've got um, what's called a, um, a signature acceptance of responsibilities. So if you write the lift plan, you say you wrote the lift plan, the lift supervisor says he's going to follow the lift plan and so does the operator. So if there's ever an accident like this, there's a legal cutoff. You've made a contract with these people you have a contract. It might not stand up very well in Qatar court, but you, you've put yourself, you've given yourself a, a slight break. Because I, I know what happens with lifting plans when they go out on site, they just sit in the cab and nobody, nobody looks at them. So why do um, lifting accidents happen? Is, uh, can anybody just shout out some things? Let's give us all the uh, things we're looking for. Some 10, 10 Azim, degrees. would you like to share? Azim Khan? Azim Kazi. Yeah. Good evening, Milba. Hey, good evening. Please go ahead. Hi, Mahmoud. I didn't see you there. Where are you from? I am uh, actually, I am working in Saudi Arabia. Ah, Riyadh or Damam or Jeddah? Damam. Damam, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Yes, you asked about the, the cause of the overturn accident actually be, before i came to Damam, i was working in iraq in al basra yeah. and uh, we got uh, overturning accident the reason was very silly the the crane operator did not extend the outrigger okay the crane capacity was 50 tons and the load was two tons, but because he did not extend uh, the uh, the outrigger, so the crane was not able to support the the load. When he started in rising the load and the and the boom was in straight position with the crane, yeah. he was able to carry these two tons. But when he turned the boom. The load shifted the center of the gravity and uh, caused uh, overturning. Okay. So the company, uh, yeah, yeah, the the client was Petro China. I was working in Bohai. It is Chinese company, and the client actually decided the corrective action decided to take uh, two corrective action. Number one, to train all the uh, crane operators. And number two, uh, to uh, implement the permit to work there because the banksman was the assistant driller. And the assistant driller, when the crane operator start in carrying those uh, two uh, drums, the, when he start to carry the load, the, the banksman or the rigger the operation without supervision, and that was the cause of the accident. Ah. So, um, collectively now, can can everybody just jump in? Why do why do lifting accidents happen? Um, just give me some things off the top of your head, one from each of you, and just see if we can get through a list of ten. And then we'll Rafikul, uh, do you want to go ahead, Rafikul Chowdhury? Why do lifting accidents happen? 
Anybody? Give me one. You can just unmute your mic and share. Sure. I believe the competency of the staff to be considered to avoid the lifting accidents. What? Sorry? The competency of staff. Okay. Training. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Good evening. Can you hear me, please? Proper lifting plan. Okay. Yeah, Rafi, could go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Actually, I would like to share one thing that uh, regarding this uh, uh, lifting accident, or me and Miss Wichan just are discussing. That I have a one experience in my one of the project. This happened in 2018. Okay. Uh, this one of our crane is just going for maintenance in the lay down area, in the crane maintenance area. So actually, that is a temporary maintenance or uh, service service station. But uh, the crane operator was almost 23 years experience in the lifting activity and also. Uh, the fly uh, riggers they have also overall more than 10 years experience but when they go to this uh, lay down area for servicing uh, they are they did not extend their outrigger and they they start the maintenance servicing and start the servicing and uh, they're cleaning the boom and as usual crane when crane was this uh, normal position that moment nothing happened but the operator in the cabin and the downside, there's a rigor was there because they're normally they're doing this one. So they have, a, I think they have a over confident or they know that what they have to do it. Later on, when the, what they did it earlier, they already removed their counterweight from the backside. So when the operator just turned the, just moving the boom, the cave in, it was automatically collapsed. That's the spell down because this water, all the waters go to underneath the tire. And once the tire is laid down due to this sun, because of the oil, uh, this desert area almost everything, everything is a sand oil. When this water is going, automatically tire is going down. So that moment I have, uh, this is the experience that I had. Just I would like to share it with you, though this is not a work related, but it's also happening some cases in the maintenance service station area, something like this. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Uh, Brad, so, Fortune has shared um, it's due to inadequate risk assessment, people taking shortcuts. Yes. Uh, we exactly. Get a lot of yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, anybody else? Uh, why do lifting accidents happen? Shall I just go through the list of what I have here? Excuse me. Sure. I just want to share something. Hello. No. Can I share? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, looking to our previous uh, explanation given by one of the guy regarding the uh, one incident happened during the maintenance time, you know, and some people they said uh, there is a lack of uh, say uh, lifting plan and everything. But now uh, in Qatar, the awareness of safety has become uh, so much. Every company has their own lifting plan, their own team. But the most important aspect here you know the competency of uh, the crane operator okay is the yep. uh, I, I believe it, it, it is the uh, main uh, crucial aspect you know of this uh, subject uh, the crane operator if he is competent you know he can control the he can control the lifting activity very well so i believe uh, uh, from all the client level you know to the contractor uh, the competency of the crane operator uh, has to be uh, evaluated very well when he joins the project. Uh, then uh, at least I can say that 80% of the um, uh, lifting activities, you know, we can do it uh, uh, safely. And uh, of course, there is a support of uh, the lifting supervisor, the riggers, and they can contribute. Um, I remember one incident happened uh, in one of the projects. Uh, which is uh, related to maintenance also, because most of the time we as a HEC person, we are mainly focused on the uh, uh, crane uh, operation, you know, during the execution of the job. Uh, but yeah. the maintenance activity of the crane also involves a uh, high level of risk. Uh, I remember one incident happened uh, while uh, one of the uh, crane operator, he had extended the outrigger uh, early in the morning and he 
he extended the boom to the full length and the angle of the boom was around 70 degree and uh, uh, suddenly he saw one of the uh, uh, maintenance guy who is uh, going to grease his boom you know he is going to apply the grease so uh, knowingly what he did uh, he just took the boom down straight from 70 degree to the full length to the zero degree so uh, the crane got toppled from behind there was a severe damage to the boom the boom was completely damaged so here uh, uh, the the competency of the operator it, it matters a lot as long as he knows uh, his uh, job right from maintenance to the operation i think it will mm -hmm. help a lot uh, for all the projects you know so this is from my side thank you very much Yes. Do you, do you know if the crane operator was actually certified on that crane? Because it sounds like that crane would have had a, needed a fifth outrigger to be deployed. Some cranes only have four outriggers. Some of the truck cranes have five outriggers. And when, when the boom goes down, the yeah. load changes. Yeah, I agree. We investigated that incident and we found that the, uh, the, for the maintenance of boom, there is a procedure that the boom has to be at zero degree, fully retracted back. And uh, the manufacturer guidance were referred during that time. We saw the, the position of the boom, how it can be. It can be some crane, they are saying it can be to the behind, to the sideways, you know. So all these aspects has to be taken into account. And uh, uh, the, uh, so overall, uh, the operator, as long as he knows his crane very well, you know, uh, mm. how right from maintenance till the operation. I think it will contribute a lot, you know, to the uh, project by having the safe lifting operation, you know, because having only competent lifting supervisor, uh, having him a LIA certification and everything, you know, that's another part. But uh, the crane operator is a key here who, who need to be more uh, trained, more verified, you know, for his competency. Because finally, yeah. he is a man who, we, who is going to lift, you know, and who's going to put the load down, you know. So uh, I believe he should be more sound than, um, than the lifting team, you know, in terms of the knowledge and everything. Yes, the, oper the operator is a key part of the team. Um, I'm surprised because yeah. a lot of people just take the competency certificates they get from TUV or whatever that, I don't know what TUV know about cranes to give out training. But exactly. I, I would expect to see the manufacturer's training. Like if you buy a brand new Lieber or a Terex or an XCMG, they actually come out and show you how to use it and they give you a, on top of your TUV certificate, they'll give you the actual just specific training for the crane. And if that hasn't happened, that means it just means somebody's got a certificate for a 50 ton crane or a hundred and they just got in and start operating it. And it's like driving a BMW or a, or a, I don't know, a, a Chinese kind of car that there's totally different mechanisms and yeah. one's got an AC After, and one doesn't. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, when we completed the investigation, we concluded with the fact that the operator who was claiming that he has a 20 years of experience, he was an excavator operator in his previous project. <laughs> That's the same thing. Yeah. So having a crane operation, he was having very, very, very few months of experience, you know, and he was not wow. well brief. Uh, and there was a lot of falsification done, you know, in his experience. So who, who assessed his competency when he, when he started the job? Uh, yeah, we, we assess, but uh, our assessment method was not so stringent. Uh, our method was during induction. Uh, we, our trainer used to verify a basic knowledge of the operator. But later on, what we did, we uh, established a special training program for all the crane operators. And there okay. was an assessment at the end of the uh, training course. So those who are able to qualify, they are able to, uh, they are allowed to operate the crane. And simultaneously, we made it apply to all the new operators who are joining to the project, including the boom truck operators who are large in quantities in any project, that uh, what is their understanding of uh, the crane operation, right, for maintenance, Till the execution of the job, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Brad, be, uh, before yeah. we go ahead, can I make a request? Yeah. Okay, guys, when you're sharing, please don't share the name of the company. <laughs> I've got to take an insurance to protect protect myself now. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, share where you are, share the experience, but don't mention the name of the company. I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brad, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, that's all from my side. Anything else from uh, from anybody? Thank you. Okay, let's let's move on a bit. So, why do the accidents happen? And and it comes down to three factors: people, which which we touched on already; competence, lack of training, their attitude, and all these affect human error. And um, we've covered a lot of these human error and lack of training, which is, is endemic in in the Middle East. People just yeah, I had riggers coming with, with no experience. And I actually like people with no experience because I can train them from, from zero. Whereas you get a rigger with five years of bad experience and it's like having a stray cat or a stray dog. You can't train them to sit down or, you know, whatever. So I actually prefer to have fresh green people because then I know where they are. So equipment. We need to make sure the equipment's capable and regular maintenance. These are these all contribute to the accident, right? We've touched on regular maintenance. And is the machine actually the right capacity or the right, is it a tower crane we need or a mobile crane? Or sometimes people get crawler cranes in when the job should have had a, a tower crane just for cost and speed, but they, they just seem to think that's what they want to do. So planning, this touches on planning. If, if logistics are right and your, your risks and hazards are considered, then everything like some sites are very tight and you've got constraints. Everything you do, you, you, you can't bring a crane in because you're gonna hit this or hit that. So these, this is what I consider as factors in lifting accidents. Now, these were what we call the main causes. We've touched on lack of training. Some of you have probably seen rigging and load failures. Uh, anybody ever seen a collapsed crane or crane overturn, the boom dropping on the ground because the, the cable snapped. How many have experienced poor ground conditions in this country or in this region? We're not, not many. Now, the ground's quite hard in most cases if it's virgin, but you see a lot of people take chances with very small outrigger pads. Um, where am I going? Sorry, my mouse is playing up. We've touched on lack of maintenance. That's endemic. People do um, what's called maintenance when it breaks down. They don't do plan preventative maintenance. They only fix it when it's broken or you force. That's what I find even with tower cranes, brand new, they go, oh, we don't need to look at them for six months. And then the rope starts breaking. Equipment failure, which we've all considered. Weather conditions. I've had a few days where the wind's been up to 16 meters a second and I've had to call lifts off where construction still want to lift. And you pick up a sheet of plywood and it's almost horizontal to the crane, but construction guys want to push on, but you're actually adding a lot and then lightning when you're the biggest thing around. And collision boom strike. Um, if you've got other cranes around or you're, you're, your guy just forgets and smashes into something else like a building or, or the structure, I'm sure that's happened at Lucille a few times. Um, and electrocution, lightning. So here's some just quick pictures to go through that what I've taken out of my files for lack of training. Um, they're quite obvious. I've actually seen these, 90% of these pictures of what I see driving around Doha. And that's my hobby, just taking pictures of bad lifting. So here's people standing under the load. Here's one guy using the load as, a, as an elevator to get up to the third floor. Um, lack of training. This is quite near my office and every day I drive by and watch this site right next door to me, totally getting on with whatever they wanted with flip flops and whatever. Uh, sorry, Brad, I think that, that's, after one, the, that's after the Avengers movie, Brad. The what? That's after the Avengers movie. Yeah, there. So everybody's seen that happen before? I've had, I've had this happen on, uh, on a previous project with, a, with a, a mute. Somebody tried to pick up a scissor lift, but they forgot to close the, um, the boom arm. And then they got it up okay and they moved it. And it wasn't until the crane stopped and then had to lower that it, or stopped its rotation that the thing flipped out and did exactly this. I was lucky though, that it was high enough and the slings didn't break because they were all brand new. 
Uh, we'll watch that again. This happened in Doha, in Al Sad, 2014. Boom truck. Anybody see that? Crane collapse, overturn. Probably exceeded its capacity for a boom truck, picking up a probably something like a five ton to six ton generator. Probably thought he could do it. This is, I have a, a, a gallery of these, poor ground conditions. And you can see people setting up in loose sand using cardboard boxes. You know, these, sometimes these, these outriggers are nailed to the bottom of the outrigger foot. And then there, that's, that's, that was the worst I ever saw. But you probably all got your own collection. This is poor planning on a job here in Riyadh. They took a 45 meter jib off um, using the wrong crane and the site was tight. So they got it off and then they didn't know where to land it. So they spent an hour moving stuff around on site. I'll touch on this later. So this was an accident investigation and there was so much wrong with this. This picture tells a story. Um, now, lack of maintenance. If you ever get a crane, you'll, you'll see ropes here, bird caging. Now, do any of you know the correct way for a wedge anchor termination? Now this picture here is a, is a wedge anchor termination and these are the correct way that they should be going. Notice the pin here that's hooked to the crane and the, the live rope is in a direct line with the, the pin. And it's terminated either by a bulldog clip and a piece of rope or the rope returned back on itself. Now the rope's only returned on itself and st stayed there so that when it travels, the wedge anchor doesn't fall out. But when a crane turns up on site, the first thing I look at is the wedge anchor termination to the hook. Now, either on the auxiliary hook or the main hook block on the, on the boom arm, you'll see this. And they're all the same, maybe different colors, rustier or quite clean. Now you see here, this one, the live is connected to the dead, which actually forms hard spots in the rope. But it tells me two things. The crane operator doesn't know what he's doing. The third party people don't know what they're doing. And it's definitely never been maintained because the people that know what they're maintaining would have changed that. So this is, a, this is a, one of the reasons for rope failure is these hard spots right here in the rope because the rope can't stretch naturally. So you're putting a hard spot. Now this one here is completely reversed. So it's actually, the live is, is coming out on the wrong side. So it's actually kinking at this point and that's gonna put a pinch spot on the rope. And over time, that will actually put up a hard spot in the rope and fail. And um, it's just the first thing I look at. And if I see that, I just know the crane's not maintained and I generally send them away. And some I've had the third party people pass this off the same day or the day before. So that's the first thing I would look at when a crane comes in. Equipment failure. Has anybody seen a fabric web sling break? Give you an idea, they take about seven times their capacity before they break. People generally take your six ton slings on the weekend and pull a concrete truck out of a ditch and then put it back in the store and it's exploded just like this. And that's some force to pull a concrete truck out of a ditch. Weather conditions, I think January in Qatar, we, we have these days, December, January, where we just have fog for the first part of the morning. I don't know what it's like in Bahrain. Uh, over here in Riyadh, it's, it's, it's quite good. We get rain here. This is a boom strike. This is a luffing crane hitting the side of a building. This happens quite a lot, especially if you've got multiple cranes working and your company didn't want to buy anti-collision or sequence the lifts with a crane coordinator. This, in most other countries, America, Canada, Australia, is one of the main causes of accidents, it's electrocution from overhead power lines. We seem to be very good in the Middle East. I've, I've never known of one happening in all my time. Maybe you guys have got different of opinions, but that's where we are with that. But if we can go through crane accident root cause hierarchy. Now, there's three main criteria. The first one is the in immediate circumstances, the stuff you pick up out on site. Oh, the the sling failed or the, the outrigger pad failed. That's your immediate circumstances. 
And then the next one is the next layer up called shaping factors. And then when we get to the high level, this is your actual root cause, is your originating factors. Now, if you're ever doing a root cause analysis and you ask the five whys, you will get to these points two and three, obviously by the third and the fifth why. So here we are, immediate circumstances. Is the equipment suitable? Is it usable? Conditions of the tools and equipments, which we've covered. Big one, people, behavior, motivation, capabilities of the workers. And the last one, physical site environment. Now is a site layout okay, lighting and the weather. So these, these are the things that you'll pick up when you go out and you actually look at an accident. And at my role, the last six years, all I get called out to do is accident investigation. And you can pretty much look at it and know what it is 90% of the time, but you have to go through all these because sometimes things crop up that you never foresaw before or the way the riggers get together and tell a story that's almost like the truth and it picks up all the key points and it gets there, but it's not the truth. So shaping factors, these are the preceding factors. Like what's your level of supervision like? Site constraints again. Now the big thing is your work design and layout. Like when you start planning a job, all these considerations need to be on paper in your site logistics plan, project management plan. Poor communication within the work team. Does the messages get through? Not just communication to the rigor and the operator. State of the team's health. I've seen sometimes where um, guys are totally fatigued working seven day shifts, 12 hours on site because that, that's the thing. And with the buses each way, they're working 14, 15 hours a day and they're mentally just zombies walking around on a night shift. So that's the things you got to take into consider. And then the next one is the originating influences. This is your root causes and it's always back to management, a procedure or, or the safety culture. And sometimes budget, economic climate, procurement decided to save some money. People aren't skilled in your management to know how to build things. They design, your designer might design the building really complicated. Quality of your project management, your top management are building out of sequence and your safety culture. If safety is like a police action, it's like some of you safety guys understand, and safety doesn't come from the riggers or the construction guys, you're always gonna be up against this. And the final one is you need to look at your risk assessments and, and your risk management for lifting and actually have a look at them and look at your likelihoods and severities. And every time you have an accident, go back and review your hazards and, and your risks based on your probabilities actually you're doing on site. Now accident pathways, like struck by a load, 50% of this is attributable to site layout because of constraints. And this is what they've found over all these things in American Canada, so I won't go on this much. Electric electrocution, 100% down to site layout they found out through all these studies. And all these precedents all relate to quality of risk management on the project and the choice of construction methodology. Methodology. So there's a little kind of how I would do my root cause just by filling in the boxes and getting to where I want to be. And there's a causality map based on incident type, so circumstances, shaping factors. But you can see the pathway, how you would get to all these. And this is research done at university level. So they've taken like 400, 400 or so accidents and this is how they get to a certain few. Now, I had a recent case in Riyadh last week and it was a Patain MR225. It was a luffing crane being dismantled on a tight site. And the crane was left up longer than, than it needed to be due to um, the facade people hadn't finished their, their job. So it should have come down months ago, but they decided on the methodology to do the hard landscaping. So what happened, they couldn't get a mobile crane in of sufficient size and they didn't want to spend the money. So they decided to use this tower crane to take the jib off. Problem is the tower crane didn't have the reach to take the counterweights off. So you see this crane taken down and the, and the counterweights are still on there, which is a massive risk for overturning. And here they decided to add on the hook with some scabby 
old slings they'd found lying around. Now, if you see this here, each one of these counterweights weighs four ton. A 16 ton cantilevered out 30 meters up on the air with no balancing moment. So if anybody knows how tower cranes come down, this should have come off first, but they couldn't slew the jib round because of, they'd taken it down below the building. So we got, there's the tight site. They, they tried to put a 45 meter jib down here, but nobody moved the skip. So they couldn't get it over here. So they were stuck landing it on the road on blocks and all sorts of stuff. So it was just a, a mess, complete mess. So the capability of the workers, conditions of the tools, we went through it all and we got down to the, the plant manager had decided to do it his way with unexperienced team. And this is the way it just, it went from, from bad to worse. So well-maintained equipment will prevent failure during lifting, loads falling, crane collapse, breakdown and delay equipment. How often should uh, lifting gear be checked? Does everybody know this one? Everybody, just not a problem. Shackles, slings, wire ropes, they should be checked before the lift. Daily devices. Would anyone like to answer? Routine. It should be checked on each lift or prior to, prior to lift any activities. Uh, yeah, I would say at the start of every day and at the end of the day, just the guys checking for damage and abrasion on fabric web slings. Sometimes yes, wire yeah. ropes. Um, for certification, and, normally it takes six months. Yes, yeah, six months. So yeah, we've, we've got... Third-party certificates. Yeah, that's a good one. Now, lifting gear, third party, six monthly basis, routine checks. I, I generally have a, ma a massive check every month with my team and daily. And then I have a quarantine system for repair or scrap if it's, or, or scrap it if it's damaged. Now, here's a question for you guys. When you hire a crane, is checking the third party certificate enough to start work on site? No. 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 Yeah. So as well, we, uh, we need to go more further by taking also the national record of the crane. Yeah. Well, yeah. some people think that when the crane comes in, they just need to check the third party certificate, check the box, check the Istimara, check the driver's license, and off they go. Problem is the crane turns up with its own lifting gear and we don't know where it's been and the certificate's 10 months old and they probably changed the rope three times and uh, the outrigger's leaking oil. So the, the crane third party certificate is only valid on the day it's issued. Now, if you read the fine print on the third party certificate or, or the, the conditions, it, you'll, you'll see that somewhere. Now, any changes could have happened on that crane. And in Qatar, the third party certificate has two parts. Does anybody know what the second part's called? It's generally inspection on the back details, of the certificate. Of the back, inspection details of the print? Yeah. This, uh, hi, Norel. This is called, yes. um, this is called the main certificates on the front and that has the expiry dates and the load test information. On the back, it's quite important that you read the annex because on the back, there's a list of 32 parts that were individually checked apart from the wire pull test and the capacity on the front page and the dates. Now, if any part of that annex has failed or there's a asterisk next to it, it will take you down to the comments section. Now, at the bottom, if there's any part there, it'll say shall be provided or be to be repaired, then the certificate's not valid. And I'll show you an example. It's a bit out of date, but if you look at this, you'll see in order, in order, in order. And in here, number, number six, hoisting limiter. And what they've said here is that that needs to be repaired. So this poor driver who doesn't speak English is pitched up on site with his boom truck thinking he's good to go. And he has to go and buy a hoist, hoisting limiter. His anti-two block, the ring, and the little alarm has been disconnected because boom truck guys generally like to disconnect it because it makes a noise when they're driving. So they just bash it off with a hammer. 
and nobody asks until they get to a, a site that's checking. So it's important that you check every one of these and there are 32. If you see any of your annexes with 25 or 27, that means the third party inspectors got in and deleted them out line items to make it look like non-applicable or in order and then give them a certificate. I've seen things like wire rope being deleted. And when I call them up, they, they get all embarrassed. So I'm not naming any names, but you really need to check this and what's actually out in sight. Because this, um, when you read the fine print from Bureau Veritas and TUV and, and they, they all have this, they only say it's good on the day. I've gone back to them 24 hours later about the wedge anchor termination. And they've said, the operator must have changed it. Like he's gone in and put the exact same amount of dirt and gr grime back on, on the, the rope and changed it back to being the incorrect way. So when you're renting a crane, some things to check before the cranes arrive on site, just get out and walk all over it. Look at the rope, the wedge termination, leaks underneath, anti-two block, the horn, the flashing light, Istimara. Because some of these guys even will come in with a fake Istimara. They'll even cut the dates out of the old one and stick them back into the Istimara and photocopy it again. And you will see a bad copy of an Istimara like this come to you. So if you can, some of them have got little holograms on them now. You want to see the original because I've seen them go into this box here, date of last examination and, and change it. And then I have to phone up and then I find out that the serial number doesn't exist or was from a previous year. So they're at every trick I've seen. Now, this is quite major and I'll only touch on it for a few minutes. This on the right, is what the ID plate looks like on a crane. This has got the VIN number, model, make, date, capacity, and all that sort of good stuff. Now note it's put on with rivets, okay? Rivets. Now this one here on the left was put on with panhead self-tapping screws. You can buy these plates in Dubai. You, know, you can go into a shop and they'll sell you a Kato plate. And you can have anything you want engraved on that. And then when before the embargo, they would import these cranes from Cato made in 1995. They would take them to the free zone, take the plate off, respray it, make it look brand new, put 2010 on the date down here and send it over to Qatar. And Qatar, when they come across the border, that's the first document they see. They then take that document and go and get an Istimara and then get a certificate for a license. And you've got a crane that's 15 to 20 years old, uh, pretending to be five years old. So please, if you see anything like that, especially with a Kato, and they stopped making Kato's in the like 1990s of this type. So it's quite easy to look at the age profile and the technology. You get in a crane that's like five years old and it's got like four levers in it and there's a hole rusted through the floor. So it doesn't fit the age profile. I'm just giving you this one because when your procurement go for the, the cheaper cranes, this is what's going to turn up, okay? And you need to know this. That and the wedge anchor would just tells me a disaster. I don't even have to walk around. Does anybody know the cost of a mobile crane to purchase? Ballpark figures. Anybody? Capital, it's a capital asset. You either buy it for your project, you bought an XCMG crane, couple of hundred thousand reals, big 500 tons going to cost you six, seven million reals. That's a large asset. So would you let an incompetent, incompetent people risk damaging it along with your production time and downtime and the damage? I mean, I, I don't know, but I've, I've seen people drop concrete beams and it's taken two weeks to cure it and three or four days to prepare it and it's a key beam and it's delayed the project by three weeks just because the rigging team came in and smashed the corner off it on the bearing. So we had to put that away and get another one, especially in our tunnel, our tunneling, they were always breaking the corners off of the um, tunnel rings. And we were lucky we had enough, but sometimes it'd be the, 
the special one that they would break. So you wouldn't let them loose. So people are a major factor in accidents prevention uh, of the human error. A good lifting team will lower the risk by having positive attitude, good knowledge, competence, and they're fit and healthy. And you really need to take care of them because they're, they're the guys that cause all the human errors. I, I didn't include operators in here because <laughs> I've never really had much of operators, but listening to your uh, comments back, I think it's something I need to add in. I've always used good companies. I've always hired good companies, paid a bit more and had good, good operators come in or recruited good operators. So the QCS, if you're familiar with it, it refers to the British standards, BS 7121. Is everybody familiar with BS 7121? If you're not, um, give me a shout through Malavan and we can, I can get you some out of date copies, but it's, it's, a, it's a series of six or seven documents. British standard one is um, general, two is maintenance, three is mobile cranes, four is boom trucks and five is tower cranes, seven is gantry cranes. It's nice to have them. They all refer to each other and the maintenance in, in two is specified for each document. Now in amongst this, they outline the roles and define the roles of um, APs, riggers and so in, in this book, they'll, they'll do the appointed person, the lifting and crane supervisor. In the book, they call it slinger rigger, but here we call it a rigger. And, and a new one, maybe you've not seen it before, crane coordinator, and also the operator. So can anybody tell me what competence is? The British Standard will actually tell you what the key attributes of these people are. But I'm asking you, would you just take a person on spec with his third party certificate, training certificate, and start them as a job with a rigger or an operator. Would anybody do that? Just put it on file and send them out there with your 5 million real Competency crane. Competency is a combination of knowledge, ability, training, and experience. Okay, you got that? Boy, that was almost word for word. <laughs> okay. So other factors is attitude and physical ability. So this is key. It's like experience, knowledge, and um, just you can't take people and just give them a certificate on a two-day, three-day course and put them out there without guidance. So why do you need competent people to carry out lifting operations? I'm going to ask a question, but I'm, anybody know the answer? Jump in. It's a quick one. Just simply to avoid any lifted accident, as okay. well as yeah, as well as uh, coordinating with the uh, with the team to ensure that there will be no any uh, any kind of uh, catastrophe on the project. Okay, so would. Next question, is a valid third party training certificate from TUV or Bureau Veritas or Scalia enough to no, establish that, competence? No, that, does, that, that doesn't justify your competency. Your competency starts from your experience and what you're saying you acquired before getting, uh, maybe getting the year point of person or something like that. So, uh, I, just, I just remembered you're a safety guy, so you know, you know this. What I've seen is people just put these in a book and throw them out in the park and then you find out after they've had an accident that they just did the course and they were a, a baker or a hairdresser and they came over and did this course and next you know they're a rigger or a, a lifting supervisor sometimes. But thank you. Yeah, yeah you've got it. Um, how would you assess competence for the various roles in the lifting team? Now, could HSE assess this? Should HSE assess it? Actually, the HSE department, they only understand the safety aspect of the lifting, but technically they are not well done. So 
for an HSC to assess a listing team, that HSC has to go uh, has to undergo the training itself, both yes. practically yes. and uh, technically, so he can know from where uh, he will ask the question and to know the person maybe uh, doing an interview or something like that, or maybe even on site. So you, 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 you can feel the response from the person that, okay, this guy is very competent in what he's doing. So that's okay. my take on it. I, I would actually have a, a team in place, first of all, and that I could trust. Uh, I've actually, on a, on a big project, had to take my first five riggers and supervisors and, and, and test them myself. And then after that, they were, they were my core team. But so here we are, the appointed person. Third party training certificate, yes. Evidence of previous lift plans, that's always nice to see. And ask him his level of competence. If he's only done his course last week, he's hardly ready to go on to complex or even tandem lifts. It's like he, he just couldn't take somebody on a course and throw them into the, the deep end. So you have to be aware of that. So for routine lifts, not a problem. Um, lifting supervisor, third party training certificate again. Actually, how much good experience does he have? Because I've seen guys coming from companies that in Qatar that have had five years of bad experience. I would rather not use them because they revert to the bad habits. I would actually take green people or good riggers and, and promote them. Uh, I'd take them guys from fresh and, and, and build them up because you'll notice that if they come from a bad company where they've got away with it, when your back's turned, they will, they will not double choke something. They will lift something with blue string if they can get away with it because they've got a little bit of knowledge and it's dangerous and they've gotten away with it before. Uh, I would actually have them demonstrate their abilities on site with a, with a, a, a small team or a, under supervision of a small lift, maybe taking a shower out. They got to be able to understand that they follow the lift plan and they do not deviate from the lift plan. Now, you take them out and you show them some slings that are obviously damaged and you say, anything wrong with these? And nine times out of 10, they'll say they're okay. And you have to point out the, the cuts and the nicks and the, the broken latch on the crane. Um, so they know how to inspect the lifting gears and they know how to set up a safe system of work. Far too often, they don't even set it up because, it, oh, we're only doing one lift. And then there's people walking through and in and out. And they've got the ability to do permits. They can follow the lift plan, which may have to be translated into their native language, but they need to be able to fill the permit in and take responsibility. And I know what happens a lot of jobs, the safety come around and do the start card because they think that's safety's job. But actually the lifting supervisor should set the morning's work up. And he's a key, key role in, in, in planning the lifts from the lift plan, not planning them, following the lifts from the lift plan. The rigor, same again, third party training certificate, amount of good experience. And they got to demonstrate their abilities on site. How, if they can know the hand signals, use of radio, how to set up a good exclusion zone and assist in setting up the crane. Now, Here's a new one. Anybody familiar with a crane coordinator? This, this is a role that you can throw into your client if, you, if you've got a problem and you can make him part of the lifting team and he doesn't actually sling lifts. He doesn't actually plan lifts. He just coordinates. So this can be anybody over 18. Generally you take a nice experienced foreman or an experienced lifting supervisor that can multitask and he keeps all your cranes working. When you have a tower crane working over a mobile crane or a mobile crane working over a boom truck or a, a concrete pump, he's the one that makes sure you don't have any collisions on site. Your anti-collision system is good to a point, but if you use full anti-collision, it will slow down your crane operations. So there are most times these guys can plan which way the crane even slews. Sometimes you only wanna go 90 degrees but in getting there, somebody's working the way you have to go 270 degrees. This is the guy that will, will get you out of it. It's, it's, it's quite common role in, in, in UK and there's no 
training for it as such. It's, it's just basically you have to be 18 years old, good eyesight, good clear radio, and you're familiar with experience of all the types of lifting equipment that's available. Now, if you have one of these guys, he's the kind of guy you put in your logistics team and part of your crane team, and he will even sequence your deliveries, your hook time, and make your job go faster, but safer. So it's kind of like safety and lifting production at the same time. So if you haven't, not familiar with that, um, let Malavan know because it, it's quite a key role when you're multi cranes and interlocking tower cranes. Keeps you um, avoiding boom strikes. Why do we need lift planning? And the second question, who do you think should write the lift plan? Anybody? The reason we need the lift plan is to make sure to follow the space system of work. For yeah. example, for example, we have maybe five tons of uh, of a load. So we have to know the size of crane or the um uh, the capacity of crane we need depending on the peak point and the drop uh, drop off point. So before yeah. you hire a crane, you know just start to make a visual impression on site from the peak point and the drop point. So from there, you know uh, what capacity of crane that requires and as well making the lift plan to ensure that, okay, maybe the supervisor they have to follow the lift plan as well. So, so who, writes, who, who, do, who, do you, who do you think should write the lift plan then? Like an engineer or a site lift. supervisor? Lifting appointed person. Appointed okay. person can, can prepare a lift plan as well as the competence professor can also prepare a lift plan. It depends on the uh, the organization from the comp uh, from the organization how the hierarchy is. What do you do if you don't have um, an appointed person? Yeah, if there is no appointed person, it is the responsibility of the lift professor to prepare the lift plan. Yeah. So basically the reason why they, they have an appointed person is the project director can appoint a person, but he has to make sure that the guy's got the knowledge. And I mean, you can be an appointed person technically without the course, but you need to have evidence that you understand the British Standard 7121. And then that goes along with your knowledge and experience and your attitude. So if you can do all the lift planning, the AP course is, is Kind of the final icing on the cake that gives you the the accreditation, um, and it puts you it, it puts you into the, um, the, the there's a very simple format of, of covering all the aspects required in a lift plan. Now, I'm going to tell you this: the the appointed person training courses in the region vary in quality and duration and price. Now, well known accredited training providers to Leah. Uh, Non-CPCS, and I think if anybody's in Oman, there's a, an NPOS course, accredited course, and the standards are generally a five-day course and cover everything that meets the BS7121, but it also has an examination on the final day. Now, I've heard of in Qatar and here in Saudi recently, uh, one of the guys went away and did an AP course, and he went away one day and came back the next with an AP certificate, and I actually asked to see a certificate and it was one day old. And it was, he did one day course. It was valid for one year. Um, I was gonna click it on the bottom here, but I, it's naming a company and I don't really wanna go into that, but they're out, out there. And there's car courses in Qatar that are three days long. And I really don't know how they get the amount of information across. Now on my other job, when I had a 500 riggers and supervisors and nine APs. My office manager and my secretary went on a LEA accredited AP course and passed it. But that didn't give them the experience and the practical skills to let me let them loose on the job. They did it as an interest because they we went through all the courses so they could talk and know what a, a bypass was and know what a bow shackle was and a D shackle and how the lift planning. 
And my secretary was writing the lift plans in the end, but they'd always be reviewed. So clever people can pass this course. Um, and you'll see them, you'll take a, a young engineer, park him on the course, and he'll come out and he'll write lift plans. But there's sort of people that match up three ton slings with three ton shackles. And then you wonder when you're out in sight, you're trying to put them together and uh, it's a little tiny shackle and you're trying to put a big web sling on it and it doesn't fit and you go, who did this? But it's in the lift plan and you can't change it. So experience knows that you don't go below an eight and a half ton shackle. Just, you just don't. And you, you standardize everything. So eight and a half ton shackles and four ton slings at a master link. And that's your gear. And if you can't do that, you go up a size. But this is what you need experience for. You can teach it, but yeah, people can go on this course It's it's if you're clever. Now planning, required to understand and convey to the lifting team a safe and concise methodology. Now the very standard, you basically specify that what crane is going to be used, capacity make, counterweights, whatever is on. And then if you've got a plan, the setup position without rigor locations and the pad sizes and how they match to the ground bearing pressure and everything's, everything's in, in, a, in a proper lift plan is, is referable. So that if something fails, you've got a document that can go straight out of the crane, straight to the police, and when they do their investigation, you did everything that you could as an appointed person. And you've got our responsibilities that you've signed off to say you've done it. So you even can on, on your plan drawing, put your load path, pick up the set down, which um, you touched on earlier, Wahid, and um, maximum loads. So you pick up a four ton load, you can take that to 30 meters with a, I don't know, a 50 meter long boom. That's everything else below that is okay. Um, PPE to be worn, you even specify if they need a harness for working at height, glasses, gloves, what type of gloves. Maybe it's ear defenders because it's a noisy. Proximity hazards, when you start a lift plan, you need to know if you're gonna set up next to overhead lines, underground services, um, what's the load like? Is the center of gravity central? Has it got sharp edges? Do you need to wrap it? Has it got lifting points for a start? So these are all things that you, it's like a tick box but it puts you into the calculations and, and it's, a, it's a common, like a, an aid to your memory to writing a, a concise lift plan. Now, sometimes you have special control measures. Like when I lift a man basket, I will not lift a man basket. And it goes on the lift plan on the schedule as a, as a load. I have to have maximum seven meters a second and I have to derate the crane by 50% or double the safe working load of, of the man basket from one ton to two ton, whatever. But those are my special conditions that go in a, in a special box. And I only lift a man basket unless there's a method statement from the people working in it. Because I don't want to take responsibility for something that they could have done either by scaffolding or a mute. Because nine times out of 10, they're lazy and they think it's a cheap elevator to do their work. And you need to push back because if your crane is like your procurement, I got the cheapest crane and it breaks down, hanging guys 30, 40 meters in the air, you've got to have water, a rescue team, a way of getting them down, and it becomes very problematic. And you've got a rigger up there as well, directing the crane who's stranded. And on hot weather, you need shade. It just, and then they're mixed now, you find they're out of the summer working hours because they went up at 10 and cranes broke down for an hour. So. All these things need to go in your special control measures. And what I'm finding is a lot of people doing these method statements that are just ticks, just ticking the box. So the final thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about here, I don't know if you can see it, is acceptance of responsibilities. Now there, there's a sheet, um, you can check up with Malavan if you really wanna see it. In your lift plan, at the very bottom of the lift plan, I as so-and-so have written this method statement lift plan to British Standard 7121, and you sign it, and that's your declaration. And then everybody else says they're gonna follow this lift plan without deviating. And the operator and the lifting supervisor sign that. So it's a separate page, and it's a series of signatures of the day shift operator, night shift operator, day shift supervisor, night shift supervisor. And that is a, a, a confirmation between you and the team 
that they've made a, a, a written signed declaration. I find it's very important because I've been doing these lift plans now in Qatar and here for about 10 years now. And, and I find that I've had no pushback yet, but there's times when I walk out and my client's going, who's responsible? And I go, operator, supervisor, operator, supervisor, pick one, because it's not me. So it's, 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 I'm all right. So if you're writing lift plans, it's a good thing to have. It's a get out of jail free card. Now, Again, the planning, the quality, the effort and quality that goes into the lift plan actually reflects the level of safety culture on your project. So if you have a nice robust lift plan and it sits in the crane cab, you don't need to refer to it every day because you can break that out as lift one and lift two as on, and put it on a start card for the day. Um, and uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Adams, Dad? Yes. Yep. Can I uh, ask a question? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, lifting man basket, right? So, yeah. um, as per the settlement two and uh, since 2017, uh, yeah. part three, uh, there is a statement. No, uh, it says that as a, as a second uh, comment or for, I mean, there are one of the, some of the requirements mentioned there for the crane to be utilized for man riding purposes. One of yes. the requirement says that there shall be sufficient proper means provided with the crane. Uh, so as to allow the occupants of the uh, platform to be uh, lowered or to allow a safe access and egress in case of a power or control failure. So yes. That means if the uh, engine fail or control fail, there shall be some means provided with the crane so that the uh, occupants of the basket can be provided, can be lowered. It's kind of, so that means it, it, is, it is pointing out to an uh, emergency lowering device. So well, that means no, uh, I, um... I think... You need to you need to factor that back. You're not going to get that in Qatar. You, and we very rarely have that in Britain. If the crane, like a tower crane, is lifting a man basket and it fails because the, the thermistors or the modules have overheated and that crane shuts down, it's not working. It can't raise, it can't lower, it can't slew. It's stuck. Now, what we did on, on a previous project is we didn't use man baskets that often, but we had what was called a... Um, a deployment system like a tower crane rescue system that was hooked to the top of the man basket and it was a rope with a, a deploying mm -hmm. system that you could actually if you were stuck yeah. you could actually everybody that went into the man basket was trained how to use it you mean like a gotcha like a gotcha similar it's called a um, milan milan 2 rescue kit and you can actually power it with yeah, a, yeah. Uh, same like gotcha yeah yeah so that has to be in the crane because if you buy one of those old Kato's and you're lifting this 1990 Kato and something happens like a hydraulic leak or there's a overheating or something, it shuts down. There's no way of getting that down unless you bring another mobile crane in to actually do a man basket to man basket transfer. The safest yeah. way is, is to assess the problem, give them water, make sure that they go up with water, with shade, and you've got a deployment system like a um, that Milan kit. Um, I get pushed by project management at senior director level to, to utilize man baskets a lot more. And, and I try pushing back and it's always like I'm the bad guy. And you can hold out for so long, but then like, cranes aren't, I keep telling them cranes aren't designed for lifting people. And you have to put that down unless you can prove there's a, no other way of doing it. Then you say, fine, but you need a method statement. And the user needs to put that in his method statement, how he's going to get out of that man basket. Put the blame, put, the, put that back to the people using the man basket, not you in lifting. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I realize what the British standard says, but that's in UK where there's lots of safety systems and get that book. All these people like facade people and somebody wants to go and do something, where's your method statement? And how are you gonna get out of that crane when the crane breaks down? And they go and buy the, the safety kit, they train their people, they take the water up and they understand that 99% of the time the crane will work, but when it breaks down for two hours, they're stuck. There's no other way of getting that crane down. Yeah, ever since that, uh, this uh, editing came up, the C confirmed Terano ATF uh, series cranes uh, have come with an option to have 
man riding or emergency lowering system for the man riding purposes uh, we have come across, i have come across the atf 220 two years back with the same system but ever since yeah. then i didn't see any other crane only one one only one crane i have seen ever uh, with this system uh, but uh, uh, the crane should have the, the standard says that the crane should must have a system integrated in it uh, so that uh, safe access can be provided for the occupants in case of a power or control failure so that I is would, actually I, yeah i would love to implement that but you have to look at the reality of the, the, the stock of cranes that are in the middle east and most of them have finished a usable life in europe or um, north america and then they've been shipped over to qatar and they're basically second hand cranes unless there's you go to a, a good company one of the established brands who's buying in new uh, your procurement it depends on who you are they'll go up the street 33 in the industrial area drive along there and pick a crane and it'll be 2000 2005 and they won't have this and you're stuck with that and you can keep turning these cranes away but in the end there's a price that you have to pay for this 2 year old crane which i don't agree with it and i'd love to have every crane to be 2 3 year old but the reality in the middle east is i've got cranes i don't even know how they get to do the job the side walls have even got rips in them so they're just not almost ready to blow a tire and it's like the oil slick coming in right? split acs that you buy in car for duct taped it into the cab and uh, anybody wants to see my worst crane collection i've got 12 years of it um so i i hear what you're saying and if i had a large capital project and the client would specify that the cranes are no older than 5 years old then that's what that's what i was showing you earlier that people were actually taking the plates off old cranes and making them look like new cranes so they conformed back in 2015 to being under 5 years old and we went through a whole spate in doha and they're still out there driving around they're still they're still there in the fleet so I, I know there's a 2017 out. I work with man baskets quite a lot, and we have it down to an art where the people going in the man basket should be responsible. You have to push it back to them. You have to inform them of the risks and say, "This is the crane we have. Cranes aren't designed for lifting people, and if you get stuck, you need to know how to how to rescue yourself." Uh, on a 300 meter high building, I had people stuck for three hours. on a tower crane man basket and we were almost ready to smash a window and pull them in because there was no other way to get them out of the man basket they were like 200 meters up in the air and there was no other way of getting them down so i i just look at practicalities i hear what you're saying but if you can push back and say unless you there's no other reasonable practical way of doing it then then make sure they write a method statement for work in the man basket to you it's just a load with special conditions wind capacity and you have to put a rigger in there so the rigger needs to sign on to your method your lift plan and their method statement and the more you make it difficult for these contractors to use a man basket they will find other ways and then, otherwise it's just a cheap taxi I I one day I I found them lifting people out of a, out of the the excavation on my tunnel job just because it was quicker than climbing up the stairs. They were filling a man basket with 10 people, no harnesses, picking them up, landing them on the ground, taking it down. Safety was buying into it at the time until they were re, you know revised, but this is going back 5 years. It's probably changed a bit now. Anyway, so What I was going to get to was there are a lot of projects in Qatar that there's a single page I've seen going around where people just draw a little thing and they don't even do a plan and it's got one or two pages with a check lift is this is it a critical lift no and you find it it just sits out there it's in the cab of the crane and 3 days later you're lifting something totally different but nobody's updated it so I've seen a lot of projects like that and I've seen a lot of contractors come to me with this little piece of paper and it, it bugs me because they don't even know how to they don't even work out the ground bearing pressure that's not even on the page outrigger pad size not even on the page okay so to overcome this problem um cranes lift things 
And it's okay when you're doing the appointed person course and somebody calls you up and say, we need to lift some roof trusses up for a day. That's a single lift in a static location. That's, and then you pack up and you never see that um, client again. But if you're on a project that's lasting six months, a year, year and a half or longer, and you're picking up things from anywhere from reinforcement to man baskets, it's best to get what's called a schedule of common lifts at the back of your method statement. Now this document covers every lift you can think of and it's got space to add more. So somebody says, yeah, we wanna lift that porta cabin. Yep, you need a spreader beam, you need this, you need that, you need this. I wanna lift a 40 foot container, loaded or unloaded, you've got two of them. Now I'm gonna show you an example of what we do on the back. And I've seen my guys have 50, 60 of these on the back of a lift plan because they've got everything. It's a recipe book and it tells them for that specific crane with, with maximum counterweight, they can say, take a 0.4 barrel of grease out to 48 meters with a 52 meter boom, or they can take a four ton portable office unit, which we've lifted a lot with a spreader beam and a master link and a lap lifting beam. And, we, and they can take that up to 30 meters. And they've got the capacity here and it, they've even got a little picture to show them that what it's like, what they're lifting. Here's one here, pack of plywood. They know it weighs 1.5 ton. It's just, so as you progressively start the job, you go from rebar to concrete skip. You just keep adding these on on like lift 12, 13, 14. And if you leave a blank in the lift plan, the AP can actually come in and write it in by hand, sign it, and then rebrief everybody and you can carry on. So you don't have to keep bringing it in and having, so the AP can do that. And then at the end of the week, he can catch up. Cause some days we've added two lifts on and we, we've sat down, looked at everything, assessed it, briefed everybody and gone forward. So if anybody wants a copy of that, um, it's, it's a nice little thing in your appendix, the, everything you're lifting. And um, it's pretty common and you can take it from job to job afterwards because it tells you all your shackles and hooks and everything you need, because it's the same from the hook down. You just need to know. Okay, so uh, I think we'll wrap it there. Um, anybody got any questions or anybody learn anything tonight? Yes. This is just touching tip. This is just the tip of the iceberg for lifting and can i have one question yes uh actually i just want to doubt about the boom trucks yeah uh see uh, some of the some of the projects i seen the boom trucks having utilizing for the uh, spools alignments instead of loading off loading is it uh safe method to align aligning spools by using the boom trucks? Um, is it, are, are the spools being lifted directly or are they dragging or doing any lateral dragging? Is it it's carry on by the boom trucks and they are aligning on the ground level. I mean, not ground level, it's almost an excavation uh, more than three meter depth. Yeah. Is it safe method? If it's written into the lift plan, uh, I treat the boom trucks as cranes. And, and to be honest, the boom trucks are my biggest risk in lifting because they're like wild animals. They're like stray cats. If you yeah, bring yes. a brand yeah, that's new- why, That's why I just having some doubts about this. Yeah. It looks I like actually, unsafe. Yeah. To, to do a boom truck properly, you need to get the, the, the specification of the crane arm. It's either Don Yang or a, um, unique or the, something like that. I can give you some examples. So the load, the maximum load of the bike so may be two tons. Okay. Yeah. The so angle may be angle, angle you can see um, 40. Do you know the 100. make of the boom truck? Is it like a, a Don Yang? What, what, what make of boom arm is it? I didn't get you. What make of boom arm? Like, like it's a red one or a blue one. If it's a red one, it's got Unic written on it. Yellow's like XCMG. Blue will be a Don Yang. It's a blue. It's rusty. So it's probably a it's Don blue. Yang. 
And now when you look at the third party, there'll be a number on there, like an SS 1927 or an SS 24200 or something like that. It, it specifies the reach and the capacity in those little numbers. The, 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 the quickest way to work out a lift plan for that is to take the, the gross weight of the truck, which you'll find when you open the door, generally they stick uh -huh. them on Mercedes 1840s and you get the gross weight of the vehicle and then you get the weight of the crane arm that actually sits over just behind the, the cab. You get to add that two together and that is your, your weight of your truck. And from there, you, you have a capacity chart on the side of the crane. You can actually go up to the, where the operator stands and somewhere near his controls, there's a little radius chart for him and it shows him his no, working you, If you go through the uh, load chart and things, it looks like uh, the load will be uh, safe load. But yeah. if you're going to down, down, down to the excavation for the leveling of spools, then I looks like, uh, you know, um, looks like unsafe. I don't know. That is why I'm just having doubts. There's enough. There's enough if, the, if, if it is in the same ground level, okay, offloading, loading, it's okay, fine. But if you're going yeah. to the uh, three meter depth uh, excavation three pits. Meters, if, if I'm going below ground with any crane, I yeah. always add on the weight of the rope. Now you're adding on maybe four, four returns at three meters on a 12 mil diameter rope. You're probably adding no more than 10 kgs, really. Three meters, 12. Work it out yeah. yourself. It's not uh, count the amount of strands. And like when we were going down 50 meters and 30 meters below ground on a, a massive 25 mil diameter rope, we were adding half a ton almost, like, you know, adding on because we're actually adding the weight. The crane is zeroed at ground level, but when you go down below, you've got to add that mm -hmm. weight on. Three meters is nothing. As long as there's enough room on the rope on the drum, when they're lifting down, have a mm -hmm. look on the drum and see if, if they're not getting near the end. There should be enough. Yeah, there because, is, I think, yeah, enough. There is enough drops, yeah, in, round, in the drum, yeah. You see. The way, the way to know that how much rope's on a crane is if it goes perfectly vertical, the boom arm, or like mm -hmm. 90 to 80 degrees, and then he lowers the rope all the way down to the ground. That's like, if there's like a seven or eight meter boom, there should be eight meters at least, plus a spare. There should be at least 16 meters on that crane to go out horizontal and go down eight meters. And the crane arm is probably what, two meters off the ground? So there's enough rope. Well, what you need to do is just look at the outrigger pad sizes because they always sit up too close to the edge of the excavation. And you need to look at the yeah. Syria, Syria series. Now, once you've calculated the gross weight of the crane, if you want to fire me something or Malavan uh, a question, I, I can show you how to work out the gross weight uh, very quickly in the outrigger pads because there's only two outrigger pads on the crane. And yeah, only two. Yeah. Yeah, so most of the load is going on the one or the other, right? Yeah, most probably on the, the load, load side. Yeah, so we, we, we kind of max it out and say that the, the whole 75% is going on one outrigger. And most boom truck outriggers are less than a meter square. So uh, say that yes. outrigger was generating 20 tons and you go down to half a meter by half a meter that outrigger pad could be generating 80 tons per meter squared. And then they set up close to the edge, probably about two meters back, and they're lifting three meters down. You need to, from the edge of the outrigger pad, you need to draw an imaginary 45 degree line, okay? Uh -huh. And that line, if it intersects through the excavation wall, then you need to move it back. So if the excavation is three meters high, you need to be at least three meters back to the edge of the excavation. It's, that's my general rule of thumb. Sometimes that is, can be that is a bigger issue. <laughs> Very difficult to get the three meter gaps from the excavation so scenario. You works people need to get involved and you maybe need to do a, but maybe the ground is stable because the top meter and a half in Qatar is generally loose. And then you get into this hard rock. So you only really need to worry about the top meter and a half at a 45 and you can go vertical. And uh -huh. generally you'll see the stuff fall away. If you were setting the crane up, you might, you might be unlucky enough to have the whole thing slip away. 
because it's just yeah. dust rocks down to about a meter, meter and a half. You'll, you'll see it in the excavation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fine. Look at, your, look at your outrigger pads and um, get the gross weight of the truck, get the gross weight of the crane arm, take 75% mm -hmm. of that, put it on one outrigger pad, and what it, 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 that's your kind of start starting point. Okay. Does everybody know that rule, the quick rule of thumb for how to work out the, the gross, the ground bearing pressure developed by a crane? No. I'll give it to you quickly. It's 75% of the rig, of the rig the load of the crane. Now that's a quick way to do that is count the axles, multiply by 12, add the counterweight if there's any. So it's six axles, 72 ton, 35 ton of counterweight. That's 105 tons. 75% of that is roughly 76 tons. Then you add your load on, which could be five ton. So it's 81 tons. That is your ground bearing pressure. Just rule of thumb, it's a bit over, but it's safe. That's 81 tons a meter squared. So if you go and, and know your ground can take 100 tons a meter squared because you tested it, you're fine. But if you then chop that base plate into half a meter by half a meter, you're increasing the ground bearing pressure by a factor of four. So you're going from 81 ton to 320 ton a meter squared. And if you double it, the base plate to two meter by two meter, you'll quarter it. So 81 will come down to 20. Very simple. A fat lady who weighs 100 kgs wearing high heels with, with a, a footprint on her high heel about the size of my thumb could generate something in excess of a ton. And you've probably seen hardwood floors where people have walked over with their high heels on and put dents in. Mm -hmm. uh, I use that analogy because it's quite funny. But you just stand there on two feet and look at the surface area of your foot and go from side to side. And you probably weigh 70 kilos. And you're putting 70 kilo on one foot over a surface area of probably one eighth of a square meter, if you're lucky. Yeah and then see how much pressure you're generating. I wouldn't say how to do a ground bearing pressure that way, but I'm just giving you how you can wear snowshoes and walk across the snow, but if you go out in your bare feet, you'll just punch right through. So if, if your ground bearing pressure is known, then you're halfway there. That's why a lot of people don't do it. But if you're on virgin ground in this region, I've tested to 100 tons a meter squared and I could go higher, but it just becomes a silly number. So 100 tons is a, is a nice, easy number to remember. But I would definitely have some plate load tests to back that up. And it's hard to get to 100 ton because you need a plate load, reaction load, like a tipper truck with 40 ton of rock in it. And generally you'll lift the truck up before the ground fails. So anyway. Um, boom trucks, okay. treat them like crane, do a lift plan, do everything, just like a, a schedule of lifts, just like a crane. Mr. Otherwise, Brad, I have a question. Yep. Mr. Brad, what are the restrictions for lifting of man basket using a boom truck? None, really. I would just have its capacity. Because there's no RCI on it, I would just have its capacity. I would actually write them and say, well, you can go out to eight meters, well, and you can lift two ton. Well, now you have to go out to six meters and you can lift two ton. Because you, you okay. two things, you either derate the crane by 50% or you increase the, the load of the man basket. So if it's a safe working load of one ton, you double that two ton. So okay. if you're trying to get a man basket on there, if you, actually, if you're trying to get a man basket on there, I would push back and get them to get a cherry picker in because there's no boom trucks. I can get a mupe that can lift up to 40, 42 meters in the air. Okay, yeah. a man basket on, on, a scissor, on a cherry picker. Why you would wanna put a, a boom truck and trust your life with a boom truck? I, I don't it's, know. It depends cheap. from, yeah, it depends from company to company where they want to use a boom truck because they, like, like in my previous company, they had around 30, 34 boom trucks, but no cherry pickers. Yeah. Uh, so 
they were rather preferring a boom truck to be lift uh, to be lifting a man basket than than a cherry picker. Now I see like there there were few restrictions like in BS seven one two one there were few restrictions about lifting a suspended man basket or an integrated man basket, and uh, it was like. very tough for to convince because it was more more like a uh, fabricated man basket which uh, inserts right in into the uh, boom of the um, oh, that one now where the where there are third part pardon the weld the man basket onto the end of the crane boom yes 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 because i i've seen the third parties they they are ready to inspect and certify those man baskets but it is uh, when it comes to working part like it will be tough for us to uh, to convince our management because when third party is ready to give the certificate what is the problem what is our problem to uh, get the third, work done third party in qatar some of the reputable companies will will certify a dead body as alive because as soon as you push him out the gate the next day he's dead well he didn't die he was alive when i checked him i find this that they're sending out third party certificates and there's only two specifications that they can test the man basket to bs1192 which is the the one for man baskets uh, maybe i got the number wrong but there is a a dedicated man basket one and it's a new one 2019 and the man basket has to be designed now and it says the crane's not designed for lifting so you can get round that but if you weld it to the crane you're affecting the british standard test for the crane no it's not okay. uh, i'm sorry uh, sorry it's, to not, it's not welded to the boom but it's an external attachment where you can get it uh, inserted in, into the boom and and you have a lock and pin type You you can you lock it with a pin, with a cotton yeah. pin and all. So that comes under the lower, and you need to look at the lower uh, lifting and uh, regulations ninety eight, and you only can do these modifications. I've had people try and do this with a forklift. They tried to put a man basket on a forklift. Same thing. Now, as soon as you do that, you change the center of gravity, and the people working in the man basket have no control over how they take the crane up or down. So you could be booming out and crush somebody, okay? With a man basket on a crane, you're dangling, so you're not really being forced out. You're just hanging there, so it's a bit safer. You need to go to the manufacturer and say, "Is it okay to stick this on the end of my of your crane?" And they'll say no, because you have to go to the manufacturer's. You have to get the manufacturer's rec, um, approval, and mm -hmm. it's in the Lawler documents, and I think it's actually in the. Um, QCS somewhere. I remember they tried to give me a forklift in the tunnel, welded onto the side of a a man basket on a on a forklift, and they were going to do this okay. not just as a a once or twice activity. This was going to be for a thirty kilometer two two tunnels for thirty kilometers, sixty kilometers, a very seriously repetitive operation. Oh, and also with the man basket, there was a pipe rack for six six meter long pipes. I had materials, a man basket, and a forklift. Not designed for a forklift, for a man basket. And I had to push back to my project director uh, in front of the client because even the client wanted it done. Um, yeah, I didn't get my bonus that year, but you know, you need to kind <laughs> of know, pick yeah, your battles. Right. But look in the lower okay. regs. If if I remember it, I'll ping ping at the Malavan, but it, but it is there, and it's like you see these man baskets are just held on with cargo straps, ratcheted up, especially on National Day coming up. You'll see them everywhere. Forklifts with a basket on it. People going up and down. Uh, uh, can I interfere? Yeah. Good evening. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Adams, uh, this uh, mentioned one of the technical guidance from FTC UK. Uh, if don't remember the technical guidance number, it's not in a lot of regs. Uh, the technical regulation says that uh, uh, non-integrated man baskets along with uh, lift trucks can be used for unplanned maintenance works or rescue purposes. For unplanned, very rare, and they have given a uh, it's like a 40 or 30 or 40 page document only to explain who can use. 
put that in there and get everybody to sign on. Okay. Any other questions? Brad, do, uh, don't you have any plans tonight? You know, we can go on for another two, three hours if it's okay for you. <laughs> yeah, I can talk the hind leg off a donkey. <laughs> Good, man. Okay. Uh, Brad, let's wrap up. Others, this yeah. will become a fully fledged course. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great, excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be sharing uh, the slides of, of today's session, some of the documents which Brad mentioned. Uh, we'll also share the recording of this session. Uh, just play them back, watch it, watch it with your team. See, even if you're unable to convince your management, at least get them to watch this uh, or get them to attend our next uh, webinar on lifting. We'll let you know shortly. In addition to this, if anyone would like to be qualified or certified with a LIA AP uh, course or the, the upcoming LIA critical tandem lift uh, course, just be in touch with us and uh, we'll provide you as much information as possible. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Uh, thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Safe lifting. <laughs> Um, so, Malam, you said uh, there, there is a tandem list for.